Good evening, so tonight I'm going to talk to you about functional programming in R yet again, so I think this will be the fourth video. I've talked to you about how to avoid writing loops using the map and the reduce function, I've talked to you about how you could catch errors more easily by using possibly and safely from the per package, and today I'm going to show you how you can write data frame centric workflows, let's call it like that. So. What you need to know is that in the functional programming there are two very important types of objects. On one hand you have the functions of course, and on the other hand you have lists. So lists are important because that's the um, object over which you will map your functions, over which you will reduce um, you will reduce that list into one single element. So it's a, it's a very important object. In R of course you have lists as well, but you also have data frames which are like a very special kind of lists. So I'm going to show you how you can write a workflow that is centered around data frames and um, over which you can do anything really. You don't need to, to actually start with uh, a data frame. You can create your own and then you do whatever you need to do and you keep all the steps of your loop, let's say, inside that data frame. So let's. I, w I will illustrate with an example and it will be clearer. So, um, in my first uh, video from um, about uh, functional programming, I used the Enron corpus, which I'm going to use here again. So the Enron corpus is is this um, very huge collection of uh, Excel, very oh, horrible Excel workbooks, and, and I showed you how you could uh, write this little function over here to count formulas and use that using map, or in this case uh, future map, which is a parallel version of map which runs in parallel, to just count the formulas in your um, in all these uh, workbooks. So here I'm just going to do that over five um, Excel workbooks. So if we take a look, we see we have here these five Excel workbooks. I'm going to change my formula a little bit because this formula does three things. This formula takes a path to a workbook, imports it using the XLS X cells function, counts the formulas, and then puts that into a data frame. We're going to simplify that a little bit. We're going to remove this and we're going to um, we're going to change that so this function instead of reading and importing uh, a workbook will just use a workbook that has already been imported. Okay, so now this function only does one thing: it counts. It counts formulas. That's it. I'm going to remove all of this below because that's not um, needed anymore. And I'm going to start by building a data frame using a bit. Maybe that's not the best way to do it, but it works for me. So. If you, if you have another way of doing that, uh, let me know. I'm going to call that myXLSDF and I'm going to use that using the treble function. Why the treble function? Because this way it's going to be a tibble. But I'm going to do something a bit weird and I'm sure there's a better way of doing it. But I'm going to create a column called paths and this column is going to have um, or is going to be populated by my uh, list from before. However, if I just do it like this, I have this very weird object down here. So now that I created my XLSDF with the triple function, what I have actually is um, a table with one column and one row. And this um, row or this column, this cell that is here, is actually a list of five characters which are actually these characters over here, okay? But that's not exactly how I want it. So this is maybe a bit, maybe you've never seen this. This is called a list column. So this is a column which contains as an object a list. So R is very special in that way. You don't need to, um, so the, the data frames don't need to be flat, right? They don't need to be like CSV files that, only, that can only contain a, ASCII characters and numbers. Um, actually, a data frame, a cell of a data frame, 
can contain very complex uh, objects. They can contain lists, as in uh, lists of characters. They can contain lists of models. They can contain lists of other data frames, etc., etc. And we're going to use that. This is what we're going to use, but not in that way. I will unnest that. So it's a very convoluted way. It's I'm I'm sure 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 that there is a better way of doing it, but um, I don't I don't know of another one. So this thing now is a table, standard table with a column with five rows, right? So that's uh, the classic. But why uh, did I do that in this way? You could use a data frame. You could define uh, your your Excel file with the data frame dot data dot frame function. But then that's going to be a data frame and it's not going to work as well. I mean, it's going to work just as well. But if you want to the um, to explore it or look at it, the print method for tables is much nicer than for data frames. And um, and and if you use the data frame and if you want to um, to show it, you will have some problems that I'm going to explain when I do step two. Now, up, let's go. Step two. So step two, I'm going to. Uh, I will not overwrite my Excel uh, DF object because I want to. I want to show you um, the evolution. So I'm going to create a new column that I'm going to call workbooks, and this column is going to be the actual workbooks or the actual imported workbooks. So I'm going to import them now. So this is in the loop. This is where you would write import or read uh, workbook, right? Um, so this is what I'm going to do now, but not inside a loop, but inside a data frame. So I'm going to use the map function for that, and I'm going to map it over the paths column, because the paths column contains all the paths that I need. And I'm going to use the XLS cells file. So again, um, this XLS XLS X cells function imports very ma messy workbooks. But uh, if uh, you had a list of um, very nice CSV files, you could use a read CSV here instead of of this. You could do anything. So remember, map <coughs> map does not care about the function you're using and about the list you're mapping it over. What map wants is that this thing can knows how to work with the elements of this list. That's it. So in this case, it should work. Let's see. And it worked. So now let's take a look at my Excel's my Excel's uh, DF2. So my Excel's DF2 looks weird. First column, you have here your uh, paths, just as before. But now you have a column called wor called workbooks, which looks empty. But that's just my uh, that's just my color scheme, my my color scheme in my editor. But you see here something very nice, and this is why I'm using tables because I have here this thing, which is one single string. But over here, I have a whole data frame. I have a whole table with an almost twenty thousand rows and twenty one columns, and this is inside this single cell here. Here we have a whole table. If I look at the second row, it's the same thing. So this column workbooks has five elements. It's a list of five elements. Each of these elements is a table. Why is that useful? You will see in step three. But let me just go back to what I was saying before the um, using tables instead of data frames. If you use a data frame, you can do that as well. It's just going to work just fine. But the print method for data frames does not support this thing. So if you want to print your table, what will happen is that R will show you the contents of all this. So it's just going to pu pollute your, your, um, your console. So you're not going to see anything. So just because of that, I'm using a uh, table here to have this nice print method. So of course you could start by creating data frame then converting it to a table, etc. But I just prefer using this triple function. It works well enough. And um, yeah, I mean, why not? Step three. Now we want to count how many formulas are inside each 
these workbooks. Maybe, maybe before that, maybe let's just look at one. So if I look at my XLSDF, and if I look maybe at the first one, I have here yeah, this very nice. So I, so I selected the first, uh, the sorry, the workbooks column, and I selected the first element of that column, which is this data frame, which is this table, right? 19,000, which is what you add over here, okay? And you see, it's this very nice data frame where um, I have the sheet names, I have the addresses of um, so of each cell, and I know whatever is inside. So, for example, in A1, there is a date inside. So it's not it's not a blank column. You see, is blank, is false, and um, and it contains a date. So you could then look over here. Well, what is inside? Uh, what's what's the date and if it was a character what was the character what interests us here is the formula is there a formula so you would have data type formula and then what formula is that so what we're going to do is we're just going to count them so i'm going to remove whatever where, where, where i'm going to remove the rows where formula is an a okay and i'm just going to count whatever whatever remains okay well this is a not maybe a very interesting example but uh, you, again, you could replace this list of Excel files with a list of of models of uh, of, the, of of whatever really whatever you have, whatever you need. You just can put it inside a list. You can put that inside a data frame, and then you can map whatever function you want over them. Okay, if you have a list of models, you could uh, map uh, a function that will uh, I don't know uh, just show you the R squared if they are linear models, for example, something like that. Um, so we're going to count formulas. So let's do that. Let's do that in uh, my XLSDF tree. So we're going to use my XLSDF2, and again we're going to create a, for a function called n formulas, and we're going to map over the workbooks the function that I created just before, which is count formulas. So I don't know if I actually have that. Now I do. And let's see what happens. Uh, workbook, oh yeah, maybe workbook, work, book. Yeah, that's not going to work. Now let's run it again. Yep, it ran, so let's take a look. Now we have something interesting happening because we now have a single integer here. So we have a list. Uh, a list column again, where each element is actually a list of one, um, of just one. So uh, here there's probably a way, I think the simplest way would, instead of using map, would be to use map double, because map double gives you, um, instead of giving you a list of numbers, it will give you an atomic vector. So it will give you something that, uh, that looks like uh, whatever you create using C. So if you do C, 1, 2, 3, that's an atomic vector, okay? If you do list 1, 2, 3, uh, oops, so that was on the wrong layer. So if you do list 1, 2, 3, this is a list, okay? So this is what map gives you. So if we use map double, we're going, we should be having the result that we want. Yep, there it is. So now we have a data frame, which gives us the path to a workbook, gives us the workbook and the formulas. I could continue working, I could continue mapping other functions to count dates, to count comments. I think you could also, you could also get, yeah, you could also get comments um, to count, uh, I don't know, whatever you, you want, really. You just need to continue mapping. But why do it like that? I find I think there's two reasons. First of all, it's very, very elegant. I think this is very clear. Of course, you need to be familiar with list columns. But once you're familiar with list columns, I think this is very, very clear. It's very elegant. And of course, you could um, shorten the code instead of, um, of writing this uh, intermediate objects that I did now for the purposes of the, of the video. You could, that, you could do that in one go. You could just do that in one go. If you're using future map instead of map, you can do that in parallel. So it's going to run super fast. Okay, that's one reason. The other reason is that now this is a data frame. 
so you could for example filter over n formulas you could say well i'm not i'm only interested into excel workbooks that have more than 1000 formulas so now you can filter that you could say well i don't need those anymore i don't need uh, those workbooks i don't care about them those that uh, have uh, sorry that have less for example whatever well that have less than 1000 um, or more than 1000 well I, I i i'm speaking as i'm <laughs> as i'm thinking and that's not good um, so so now i can keep only these workbooks that interest me so this is much much easier to work with because if you're using a loop you need to build an object, which will probably be a list, um, to be able to do this kind of stuff. Or you need to write that inside the loop, but then you, you lack a lot of flexibility because you already need to write in the loop that if that Excel workbook has more or less than 1000 formulas, you need to drop it. But what if the requirements change? What if instead of 1000, it's 2000? Then you need to run your loop again. Um, what if I don't know, what if you, you need to do more stuff than just uh, filtering uh, over the amount of, of formulas? You need maybe to transform um, the amount you need to, I don't know, take the square root of that or whatever. So here you can do anything you need, anything you want, very, very easily. And you could also save that object, right? Because that object here is not... Um, that's not uh, you. You cannot save that into into a CSV file. That, that it's not going to work. But you can save that as an RDS object. So save RDS um, can save any any type of R object, any type of R ob object into disk, and it can read it. So you can close R. You can turn off your computer on Friday evening and Monday morning when you get back to work you read your RDS object with read RDS and uh, it's going to be exactly as you left it here it is so you can save that object and then you can do whatever manipulations you need to do so this is for me exactly this type of workflow is what for me makes R the most interesting language for data science and statistics hands down because this is for me the simplest way the most elegant way to write code and to analyze your code so and, and your data because again these things here this could be um, CSV files this could be a model that I'm training over them and then this could be for example a performance metric or this could be uh, a, C a CSV file, a path to a CSV file or an Excel file this could be a table as I'm doing now and this could be a plot, this could be even a GG plot so inside a data frame you can have anything you can even have a GG plot so you will have a column which will contain a list of ggplots so you can then do exactly the same you could for example imagine if you have uh, your your building plots for uh, all european countries and um, and then you you want to so you're building all your plots so you have this nice column but then you only need to send in the plots for i don't know for the eurozone so for uh, the americans listening the eurozone is not exactly the same as the european union there's less countries using the euro than, than there are countries in the European Union. So you might, so your boss might ask you, yeah, send me the plots for the Eurozone. So you can filter over them. You can here yeah, filter, just send the plots for the Eurozone. Instead of doing manual, that, instead of doing that manually, which is always error prone. Whatever you need to do manually, you there's always going to be an error that's going, that's going to creep in. Not to say that you cannot make mistakes when you code, but um, at least you have source code that you can read and reread and and make others read very important to um, to have colleagues that can read your code um, and that and that also do that so for me this is really what makes R the most interesting language in terms of analyzing data because you can do this type of stuff first of all there's um, functional programming capabilities already inside the base R uh, language you don't need you don't need to use the tidyverse 
but the tidyverse brings all these niceties which for me hands down most uh, most interesting language there is for data science so um yeah, I think that's all I want to show you for you now. I'm probably going to do some other videos like that where I'm going to show you how you could um, do other stuff. But the logic is always going to be the, always going to be the same. It's always going to be this um, this approach where you you mutate uh, list columns using map or map double or whatever. But maybe I'm going to illustrate that with uh, some more examples. So um, hope you enjoyed and uh, well, it's almost Christmas so. If I don't make another video until then, Merry Christmas.